Good morning. Welcome to worship at the Presbyterian Church of Wilmington. We are so glad you're here and that you could join us. We're glad to be in the sanctuary, but we're glad to welcome our friends on Facebook Live as well. Um, I ask your prayers today um, for Sue Shaw. I ask your prayers for Lori Gillette. She's having surgery on Tuesday. So Tuesday, I'd like we can lift her up in prayer and Jim and the, the doctors, that would be good. And I wanna thank Judy K. Johnston for a wonderful brunch yesterday with Presbyterian women. It was um, so well received and timely and wise and wonderful. So thank you for sharing the program yesterday. I also wanna welcome Phil back from, I always get it wrong, Kirkmont? Kirkmont, the church camp that's far away, not the one on 73. That you, Kirk, you know, for some reason those confuse me. But welcome back, Phil. We're glad that you had a great week and that uh, you're back with us today. Friends, it's good to be here. It's good to be in the presence of one another and especially the presence of our Heavenly Father. Welcome. Welcome to worship. The Lord be with you. Great to see all of you. And uh, as we begin our worship service, I invite you as, as you're able to stand and we'll go through the call to worship from Psalm 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and, I, and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you brought up my soul from Sheol, restored me to life from among those gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you God's faithful ones, and give thanks to God's holy name. Our opening hymn is number 489, Open Now, Thy Gates of Beauty. Lamentations 3, verses 22 and 23 tell us, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. 
Confident of God's steadfast love and faithfulness, let us confess our sins before God and one another. O Lord, our God, you call us to work for a world where all will be fed and have dignity. But we find ourselves distracted by our own desires. You call us to seek justice and peace, but we are satisfied with injustice and discord. You call us to bring liberty to the oppressed, but we do not insist on freedom for all. Forgive us, O Lord. Turn us to your will by the power of your Spirit, so that all may know your justice and peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Because we were buried with Christ in the waters of baptism, we are also raised to new life with him. Believe the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. peace of Christ be with you all. Let us share the peace of Christ with one another. Peace be with you. and girls, it's good to see you. How are you? Good. Are you staying cool? Uh-huh. I have a good question. It keeps my microphone in place. And it's not duct tape. It's scotch tape. Come on up, girls. Um, are you wearing your sunscreen? No. Please wear sunscreen. Sarah didn't wear sunscreen yesterday, so that's why I'm sunburned. Also, parents, we are going to go outside and play today. So when, I knew that would be, we're going to have our, our lesson and then go, so we'll be on the playground when church is over. But we have to get through our lesson. I know. Oh. So I have a question for you, okay? Good, come on up. What would it look like to you if we had heaven down here on earth? What would it look like if, heaven was right here that you lived in heaven right here what would be different maybe no you would just be you but the whole world would be perfect so you know let me let me back up so we talked about two weeks ago we talked about the lord's prayer and we talked about do you remember these words our father 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And we said that that meant, dear holy God, you, your name is holy, right? And then the prayer goes on to say, let's say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that prompted me to think about what um, Jesus was saying is that we pray that things on earth are kind of like they are in heaven. And I was just wondering, what do you think it would be like if our world, where we lived in right now, was perfect? It would be like Florida. How many people would agree? Florida is almost perfect. Yep. Well, let me, let me make that question smaller. Let me ask you this. What if your, um, what if your moms and dads and your brothers and sisters, so let's say our families, whatever that looks like, what if our families were perfect? So would we ever disobey our parents? We would never disobey our parents, would we? Because we would be perfect. Would our parents ever get mad at us? No, because there's no anger in heaven. What about our friends? Would we ever fight with our friends? No, we wouldn't because it would be heavenly. God's will is that we get along, that we understand one another, we forgive one another, and we all are harmonious in the way we act with each other. So if your teacher said, I need you to do 10 math problems and bring them back the next day, would you be like, oh, I don't want to do that? Yes. No, not in heaven, though. Not if earth was like heaven. So I think what Jesus is, is really telling us to do is think about ways we can bring God's heavenly plan right down here on earth. Think of ways just in your life Maybe one thing you could do different this week that would bring God's plan of love and forgiveness and compassion and grace down. Maybe it means you obey your parents the first time they ask. Sometimes that's hard. We do what our parents want, but they have to ask us 10 or 100 or 1,000 times. Some or 10,000 times. Sometimes we're short tempered and kind of grouchy, and those things wouldn't be there. I want you to think today, and I want you to think this week about just one thing, and we're going to talk about this in Sunday school. One thing you could do that would make our earth a little bit more like what we expect heaven to be like, okay? All right, will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for teaching us to pray. Help us bring a little bit of heaven into our world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Today we continue our series of sermons from the book of Acts, and we come to Acts chapter 3, and our text is verses 1 through 16. Assuming I have the same Bible that's in your pews, it's page 112. Page 112. So hear the word of God as it comes to us now from the book of Acts. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at three o'clock in the afternoon. And a man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the beautiful gate so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him as did John and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's portico, utterly astonished. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people, you Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself, has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. This is the word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Lord, speak to us now and silence all of the voices of confusion, fear, and doubt, that we might hear your still small voice. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you. O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Last week, we saw Luke summarizing the marks of the church, the four spiritual practices that every church must be devoted to in order to be truly a church. The teaching of the apostles, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayers. And we saw how the early church engaged in those practices on a daily basis. In response, Luke tells us that the Lord added to their number those who were being saved, and they had the good will of all the people. Within, without those four essential practices, which said biblical teaching and preaching, loving Christian fellowship, faithful worship, including holy communion, and fervent and frequent prayer, a congregation may have the outward appearance of being a church, but will most likely be caught up in a cycle of institutional maintenance and survival, rather than actually being the growing, thriving church that God intends it to be. So today we come to Acts chapter 3, the story of the first miracle of healing performed by the apostles in the book of Acts. The story begins with Peter and John going up to the temple at 3 p.m., one of the traditional hours of Jewish prayer. And even though Peter and John and the other apostles were now followers of Jesus, they were still Jewish. And so they continued their participation in the rituals of Judaism. And on this particular day, they encountered a man who was no doubt a a familiar sight to anyone who passed that way, 
Such sites are not unusual in many places around the world, including in the Middle East. People sit or stand in the same place day after day, begging for money from passers-by. If you've been to any third world country, you've surely seen this. Sadly, we've seen it more and more in our own country. Forlorn persons standing at the end of the freeway exit ramps, holding cardboard signs that read something like, homeless, please help, any amount will do, God bless you. And if you're like me, you find it hard to make eye contact with such persons. You may find yourself handing them a dollar outside your, through your window, through your roll down car window. But most of the time, isn't it true, we avoid looking at them. No doubt we all feel a sense of relief when the light changes. We can accelerate on through the intersection and thereby put that needy person out of sight and out of mind. Certainly the people who went to the temple each day would not have been at all surprised to see this particular lame man. His friends brought him to that same location every single day, Luke says, and he would beg for whatever he could get, and I'm sure some, of his, some days his take was better than others. And I can hear him saying, have pity on me, have pity on me. In other words, give me some money. Could you spare some change? I'm reminded of the scene in Monty Python's satirical film, The Life of Brian. Brian and his mother are heading home when they pass a group of beggars. And the first beggar says, alms for a leper. And the second one says, alms for a leper. And the third one, who's clearly not a leper, says, alms for an ex-leper. And Brian says, did you say ex-leper? And, and he says, that's right, sir, 16 years behind the bell and proud of it. And Brian says, well, what happened? I was cured, sir. Cured? Yes, sir, a bloody miracle, sir. God bless you. Well, who cured you, Brian asks. Jesus did, sir. I was hopping along, minding my own business, when all of a sudden, here he comes, cures me. One minute I'm a leper with a trade, next minute my livelihood's gone. Not so much as a buy your leave. You're cured, mate, bloody do-gooder. And Brian says, well, why don't you go and tell him you want to be a leper again? And he says, oh, yeah, I could do that, sir. Yeah, I could do that, I suppose. But what I was thinking, I was going to ask him if he could make me a bit lame in one leg during the middle of the week. You know, something beggable. And the lame man in our story is clearly beggable. And so every day his friends brought him to that spot where he asked for alms of those who entered the temple. But on this particular day, this man gets far more than he bargained for. He makes his request to Peter and John just as he did with everyone. And when we think back to what we heard last week about the believers sharing their goods and possessions with everyone in need, Peter's response here is all the more interesting. Remember how Acts 4.34 said there was not a needy person among them. Why? Because money had stopped becoming, had stopped being the most important thing to them. They had discovered a new power and a new way of life. A way of life that valued people over profits and that placed compassion ahead of greed. And so what Peter says to the beggar arises out of this new way of life. A way of life inspired by a savior who extended the hand of love and grace to all regardless of their wealth or their status. No, Peter didn't have any silver or gold, but what he does have is something much better, something of an entirely different order. He doesn't even ask the lame man if he wants to be healed. He just goes ahead and heals him in the name of Jesus. I don't have a nickel to my name, he says, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Peter then takes the lame man by the hand and raises him up. Immediately, the, the man's feet and ankles are made strong again. And, and, then, and then not only does he stand, but he goes walking and leaping and praising God throughout the temple. 
His response recalls Isaiah 35, which says that the lame shall leap like a deer when the redeemed return joyfully to Zion. And here we see for the first time in the book of Acts two interesting phenomena. First, Luke emphasizes that Peter and John looked intently at the man. They didn't just glance at him and then toss him a coin and hurry on by. Rather, they st stopped and they looked straight at him. They looked deep into his eyes and they looked deep into his soul. And what were they looking for? Were they looking for a sincere spirit ready to receive more than he asked for? Were they looking for a heart full of sorrow and pain, ready to be touched by God's healing love? There is something vitally significant about this deep face-to-face, eye-to-eye encounter. Not only do Peter and John look intently at the man, but they command him to look at them. No good turning your face away in embarrassment, as so often happens with beggars who are ashamed to catch your eye. And we who pass by are equally ashamed to look at them. What happens here is, involves a deep human connection, as well as a deep work of God. And then second, Peter says something that will resonate throughout the rest of the book of Acts. He doesn't just say, stand up and walk, as Jesus himself perhaps would have said. Peter makes clear where the healing power resides. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he says, rise up and walk. It is the power of the name of Jesus that counts here and everywhere. The idea of names having this kind of power is strange of us, strange to us who live in the, in the modern Western world. But most people in the first century world and many people in third world countries would understand exactly what was happening here. Of course names carry power. The power of magic, the invocation of mystical forces, the summoning of new possibilities beyond normal human abilities. Luke makes the point that from this moment on in Acts, the name of Jesus carries great power. Invoke his name and new and unexpected things will happen. And this is as true now as it ever was. The name of Jesus turns a beggar who sat outside the temple into a worshiper who went walking and leaping and praising God all the way into the temple. And I've seen the name of Jesus give unexpected courage to those facing terminal illnesses. I've seen the name of Jesus turn alcoholics into sober, responsible people. I've seen the name of Jesus turn timid, fearful teenagers into confident, competent adults. That, my friends, is something to ponder. And this brings us to a third important thing that's going on here. Up to now in Acts, the whole story, as you know, has taken place in Jerusalem. In fact, in Luke's gospel begins in Jerusalem with Zechariah in the temple and ends in Jerusalem with Jesus telling the disciples to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon them. And so the whole story to this point has happened right there in Jerusalem. We find the believers going regularly to the temple to worship, even though, as we saw at the end of the previous chapter, the most important things they did, the teaching and fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayers, probably was happening in the homes of individual members of the church. But the demonstration of the power of Jesus' name in the healing of this lame man takes place not in the temple, but outside the temple at the gate called Beautiful. God is on the move, but will not be confined within the institution. God is breaking out into new worlds, leaving behind the shrine that had become a symbol of worldly power and resistance to God's purposes. This theme will come to a head four chapters from now with the story of the stoning of Stephen. But while Luke's gospel begins and ends at the temple, what he is telling us now is that the good news of Jesus, even though it begins in Jerusalem, is starting to reach beyond Jerusalem to everyone and anyone who needs it. No longer will God's healing power be confined to the temple and to those who frequent it. No longer will they just look to the traditions 
handed down from their ancestors for their source of spiritual strength. As Jesus told them back in Acts 1.8, now the gospel first proclaimed in Jerusalem will move out to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, and they will be his witnesses in all those places. And so this is one of the main themes of Acts that we will see echoed over and over in the course of the story and in the sermons over the coming months. This too is something for us to ponder. Luke goes on in this text to describe how for the second time in the book of Acts, a large crowd comes together in response to this spectacular God-inspired event. In chapter 2, of course, it was the day of Pentecost and the crowd gathering to hear these unlettered disciples proclaiming the word of God in languages they had never bothered to learn. Now Luke says all the people ran together to Solomon's portico to see what had happened. And think how dumbfounded they were at the sight of this lame man who they had seen every single day begging at the temple gate, now walking and leaping and praising God in the temple. And Luke says they were utterly astonished, and rightly so. Wouldn't you have been? I'm sure I would be. And would we not, like them, be, know, be eager to know what was behind this tremendous event? And so for a second time, Peter, seeing that he had a congregation gathered, did what any preacher would do, stood up and preached. At first, he disavowed any credit to him and John for this miracle. You Israelites, he says, why do you wonder at this, or why do you stare at us as though by our own pi power or piety we had made him walk? It is the God of the patriarchs, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God who has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you rejected and handed over to Pilate to be executed. He is the author of life, whom God raised from the dead, and of this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, Peter concludes, well, concludes this part of the sermon, not the whole sermon. You can read the rest of it later, but... Verse 16, by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. It was not, therefore, a matter of a magic trick or some kind of sleight of hand intended to excite their wonder for a moment and then fade away almost instantly. It wasn't us, Peter says, it was Jesus. This miracle is by the power of his name. So you better repent and turn to God, he goes on to say, so that your sins may be wiped out. Well, when Peter finishes his sermon, the temple authorities show up and are much annoyed. They immediately take Peter and John into custody and send them off to jail. Next Sunday, we'll see how Peter and John are dragged before the authorities who thought that they held all the power, and they warned Peter and John to keep silent about the name of Jesus, not to preach or teach in his name anymore. But the day ends with Luke telling us in chapter 4, verse 4, that many who heard Peter's message believed, and the number of people who became part of the church that day was about 5,000 people. God was powerfully at work, lives were being transformed, and the church continued to grow, both in strength and in depth, and in numbers. So what lesson can we draw from this first healing story in the book of Acts? Well, I think there are probably many lessons we could draw, but I'm going to focus in one direction. Sometimes we in mainline churches think that if we just rewrite the bylaws, or update the policies, or tinker with the organizational structure, we can renew and re-energize our life as a congregation. Denominations think that way too, don't they? How many times has the Presbyterian Church been restructured in the course of your ministry? <laughs> over and over and over. And, 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 and sometimes we think that that's what we need to do. We need to do a restructuring. We need to do a, a change of emphasis. We need to set new goals or new objectives. We need to rewrite the bylaws or the constitution or the policies and procedures. And, 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 and that will revive us and renew us. Well, I've seen this over and over in my years as a pastor, and I could give you several examples. One church I served decided to write a new constitution. Three members of the church were assigned the task. 
They were all great people. One, one was a prominent business executive, a leader in his field. The second was, was a former school board member. The third was a, a denominational executive who knew all about how churches worked. They wrote a, a constitution that was going to be more efficient and give us a clearer focus and a sense of purpose as a congregation. It was approved by the congregation and it took effect the following year. But did it, did it change the inner dynamics of that congregation in any appreciable way? Not one bit. And in fact, three years ago, that church closed. And I was there on one of the final services to help uh, celebrate the past and grieve the closing of that congregation. So listen, friends, if, and I could tell you other stories about this kind of approach, but if a congregation does not radiate a vital experience of faith in Jesus Christ, if it does not have a clear and compelling message of grace, love, and acceptance to offer to the community, if it is not a place for spiritual healing, then all the tinkering with the institutional machinery in the world will not make up for the deficit. We can't give to unchurched people in our community what we don't already have. The question is, can we at the Presbyterian Church of Wilmington be a healing community? Can we be a place where those who are crippled by the burden of sin, by the chains of guilt, and by the shackles of fear, find liberation in the spirit so that they can join us in following Jesus Christ? It's hard to share the love of Christ if you haven't experienced it for yourself. It's difficult to offer a helping hand if you've not been touched by Christ's grace at the point of your own need for healing and strength. It's next to impossible to lift others up if you haven't been lifted up out of your lame, crippled experience. We can't give what we don't have. But if we as a congregation have experienced God's grace, and if we devote ourselves to the preaching and teaching of scripture, to fellowship and to worship, and especially to prayer, and if we make space in our hearts and in our fellowship for those who are spiritually and physically wounded, to, where, to be a place where they can come and find spiritual healing, wholeness, and grace, then how can we keep silent about what we have seen and heard? The late uh, preacher and, and pre professor of preaching, Fred Craddock, told the story of Frank. A 77-year-old man he met in Washita Creek, Oklahoma, a little town with a population of 450 people and four churches. Those four churches were Methodist, Baptist, Nazarene, and the Christian church, Disciples of Christ, that Fred was the pastor of. And each church had its own share of the population, but no one, none of them, not any of those churches had been able to reach Frank. And at the little downtown cafe, the farmers would sit around and say, Oh, Frank, you'll never get him into church. And Fred Craddock says that when he met Frank, he got the standard line. I work hard, I take care of my family, and I mind my own business. As far as I'm concerned, everything else is fluff. And that's why everyone in town was dumbfounded when Frank came to church and presented himself for baptism. There were lots of rumors flying around about why he was doing that. 77 years old, always minded his own business, but some folks thought maybe he was dying of cancer or some heard he'd had heart problems, or was having heart problems, or, and, and some thought maybe he was just scared to meet his maker. After all, at 77, you don't know how many days you have left, right? could be tomorrow or it could be years. But Craddock says Frank told him why he did it. He said, you know, I always said, I work hard, I take care of my family and mind my own business. I said it all the time. Only thing was back then, I didn't know what my business was. Now I do. And so Frank discovered what his true business was and so have we. As a congregation, our business, our calling, if you will, is to be the church of Jesus Christ, a loving and growing community of faith for all of God's people. So let's recommit ourselves today to answering the call to be a church of love and healing 
of grace and acceptance and joyful welcome for all the children of God here in Wilmington and Clinton County. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Lord, take us by the hand and lift us up. Restore us to a vital, courageous faith so that we might be your church in this place and welcome all who desire to walk with you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And now I invite you to stand as you are able and let us affirm our faith. As today, today we recite a portion of a brief statement of faith. Let us say what we believe. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of peoples long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, come Lord Jesus. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. and 
trust his grace. I'll cast on him my every care and wait for thee, sweet hour of Mike Wallace is going to share some thoughts for a mission moment. In support of uh, some of the things that uh, uh, Pastor Gockel talked about this morning, of course, I'm getting close to that age of 77 he talked about, so you have to I'll just bear with me here. But I pulled out some old notes uh, that I read maybe about a year and a half ago up here on the same, uh, the same place and same time. And so what would really be revealed to us if we really asked with humility and then followed through with the hard work of learning and discovery? What information do you need? What discoveries and opportunities are possible? You've heard me speak many times, and I have up here. I've talked many times about one of my heroes, George Washington Carver. George would take daily walks with God. And during some of those walks, God revealed to him secrets that we still rely upon today. George once asked God for the key to his kingdom. And God responded, oh, little man, you have no idea what you're asking for. But he said, I tell you what. I'll share you the peanut. And so it grew from there. In a book called Expect Great Things, there is a quote which I ran across recently. And it says, almost everyone, almost everyone believes that prayer is important. But there's a little difference between believing that prayer is important and believing that prayer is, an, is essential. Essential means that things will not happen without prayer. Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Mount to keep asking and will be given you. Keep seeking and you will find. Keep knocking on the door and the door will be open to you. We're told in James that if any of you lack wisdom, ask him of God and will be given to him. In Jeremiah, God says, come to me and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. In 1 Timothy, Paul urges Timothy to start focusing on his teachings on church prayer. One of God's great plans for the church, as we talked about this morning, is to be a place of prayer. In Mark, Jesus says that we should become a house of prayer. And if you remember, a little over a year ago, we started praying for the service on Sunday mornings uh, before the service. We, we did that for roughly a month, and then the coronavirus hit, and that ended all that that we, that we were doing. And with all this in mind, the Evangelism Committee really wants us to make sure that we as members take this initiative in prayer. It's not that any of us think that, that we don't pray, because I believe we all pray. But sometimes we tend to get in one little corner in prayer. We want to make sure that we're keeping the life of our church involved in prayer as well. And so there, there, there's one thing that we've got coming up that we want to really try to emphasize uh, for these next few weeks, and that's our Vacation Bible School. Now, Sarah has, has run off several little reminders that's out there in the North Texas. I see them this morning. There may be 50 or so out there. If everybody grabbed three or four of those and took them with them, hand them to somebody you know, uh, to, to try to get children here, you know, and there's things for us to pray for, uh, for, for that thing. And that's what I really want to emphasize for us this morning. 
When you go into their prayer closet, maybe put one of these things up there, but give you ideas about things that you could pray for to help this thing going. As an example, we obviously we need participants, right? So we could pray that, that God sends us more people. Let's get some children in this church. You know, that would, that would be a good thing to pray for. There's organization. There's planning. There, there's supplies, workers, food, information. There's a lot of individual things that each one of us could come up with and pray for. And your imagination can run wilder than mine, that's for sure. But when you break it all down, you can see that we really need a lot of help here. And each one of you can help us in that way, that's for sure. So let's kind of put this as a goal. Let's, let's stick up the vacation Bible school. We've got four weeks before this thing starts to happen. And we'll get new people in here. We'll get people who may have never been to this church before to help us, which is all part of our mission as a church, that's for sure. But if we get behind us, let's see what we can do. These are seeds that can be planted for a lifetime. Seeds that we can plant, that our church can plant through Sarah and through what's going on. Let's plant those seeds. There's also, uh, we talked about that we're going to try to rekindle the prayer groups that we were trying to get started, but we've moved them. We tried to pray up back in here, which was good and successful. We're going to move the prayer to uh, Pastor Gockel's office, which is just off the narthex out there. And we'll start at 9.30 in the morning before every Sunday service. And we can pray for the service. We can pray for members. We can pray for the life of our church in the various forms. There's a lot for us to pray for. And we can do that at 9.30 before each service. So we welcome you. And when the crowd gets too big for his office, we'll find a larger area. But the, everybody is welcome. Come at 9.30 and we can pray for what's going on. This is good stuff. Let's see what we can do. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. So next Sunday morning at 9.30, you want to help bathe the service in prayer, come to my to the pastor study at 9.30, and we will spend a, spend a few minutes praying together, praying for the service and everyone and who comes. So please join me. Let us, as we go to prayer now, let us lift up the situation in Miami, Florida, the collapse of the uh, condominium building, many people who are still missing in the terrible situation there. Also, let's remember Sue Shaw and Yvonne Reagan, two of our members. Uh, Yvonne's still with us, still hanging on, but still getting hospice care and uh, just very weak and, and uh, not able to uh, communicate much, but uh, uh, just keep her in your prayers. Let's, let's unite in prayer. Let us pray silently. Creator of the stars of night, your people's everlasting light, O Christ, Redeemer of us all, hear your servants when they call. Hear your servants, O Lord, as we lift to you the needs of your children, both near and far. We pray for all those affected by the terrible collapse of the Champlain South Tower in Miami. One moment people are safe in their homes, asleep in their beds, in the next moment, there's chaos, destruction, and death on a massive scale. And so we pray for the souls of those who've died, and we pray for those who are still missing. We pray that if, by some miracle, a few more lives might be saved. We ask for your special comfort and strength for all the families who are anxiously awaiting word of their loved one's fate. And we pray that building codes and maintenance standards might be strengthened as a result of this tragic event. Hear your servants as we pray for those whose lives are endangered by war and unrest. 
those who struggle for justice, those who seek after peace. We pray for the suffering, the imprisoned, the hungry and homeless, those trapped in poverty. We pray for the sick and those who care for them, who bring a cup of cold water in your name to those who are thirsty. Hear our prayers, gracious God, for those we have named this day, including Yvonne and Sue, and for those we name now in the silence of our hearts. Hear your servants, O Lord, as we lift to you the needs of your church, whom you've redeemed by the sacrifice of Jesus. Give it pastors and ministers, elders and deacons filled with your spirit and with strength to serve by the guidance of your word, perfected in love and in compassion, and establish it in the faith of your saints, uniting all your people that one holy church may bear witness to you and to your glory. At your great name, O Jesus, now, all knees must bend, all hearts must bow, all things on earth with one accord, like those in heaven, shall call you Lord. And so we unite to pray the words Jesus, our Lord and Savior, taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 408, Where Cross the Crowded Ways of Life, and we'll sing verses 1 through 4. Please stand as you are able. Mm -hmm. 